Welcome to the Top Business Leader Show, powered by Rise 25 Media. We feature top founders, executives, and business leaders from all over the world. Hi, Chad Franzen here, co-host for the show where we feature top restaurateurs, investors, and business leaders. This is part of our Spot On series. Spot On has the best-in-class payment platform for retail, and they have a flagship solution called Spot On Restaurant, where they combine marketing, software, and payments all in one. They've served everyone from larger chains like Dairy Queen and Subway to small mom-and-pop restaurants. To learn more, go to spoton.com. This episode is brought to you by Rise25. We help B2B businesses to get ROI, clients, referrals, and strategic partnerships through Done For You podcasts. If you have a B2B business and want to build great relationships with clients, referral partners, and thought leaders in your space, there's no better way to do it than through podcasts and content marketing. To learn more, go to rise25.com or email us at support at rise25.com. My guests today are Kaja Bednars and Brittany DeLeon, the co-founders of the fast casual restaurant Fair. Kaja and Brittany, inspired by a shared love of fresh seasonal food, partnered in 2013 to create a restaurant specializing in healthy, delicious meals. With multiple Chicago locations and a wholesale prepared foods, lo- prepared foods line, Fair is dedicated to using high-quality, simple ingredients making and making eco-friendly decisions. Kaja and Brittany are passionate about building their healthier communities and changing how people think about healthy eating. Hey, Kaja and Brittany, thanks so much for doing, joining me today. How are you? Good. Thank you for having us. Hey, uh, tell me, what were you guys doing um, in 2013 or before 2013 when you first came up with this idea? Like, what were you doing, obviously, not involving FAIR? Yeah, I can I can start there. Um, I'm Brittany. So happy to be here. So thank you again for having us. Um, Kasha and I were working together at a restaurant uh, here in Chicago called the Gib- called Gibson Steakhouse. And we worked for the entire group, the Gibson's Restaurant Group. We found our way there, you know, working jobs for them during our time in college and then started our our first careers there uh, in the private dining department. That's where we initially met each other. And we were really in our young, we were in our early 20s at the time, just exploring what it meant to eat healthy and feel good and feel good about the things that we were putting in our body. And we were really exploring those things at the same time. And so it was this very serendipitous moment of um, sharing similar looking lunches at work and being excited about ingredients and really feeling like, why doesn't anything like this exists to fuel us through our busy, long, long hours at, at the restaurant. So how long had you guys been uh, talking about it without before coming up with an idea like, okay, we're, we're going to start our own thing? Well, originally, Brittany wasn't a big fan of me. So, you know, we, we had to get her to come around. We decided it was better to join forces and, uh, and work together. Uh, we actually started with um, an idea for a protein bar. You know, we were on the go and we wanted to create something that was really accessible and easy to eat that we felt really nourished by. And so we, we worked on a protein bar. Our ex bar beat us to it. Um, and after cooking for friends and, you know, bringing in these lunches to the office, And we're in an office where you got free lunch, you know, from these like beautiful restaurants. People were really interested in what we were doing. And so we started cooking for people in the office and we started catering and doing like side gigs. You know, basically anything, anyone that would be interested in what we were doing, we were willing to make food for them. And I would say it was probably like a year of doing that. And we were doing that while we were working at Gibson's, you know, side hustle. They they know now and are great partners of ours. But we were definitely, you know, on the weekends and on our lunch break delivering catering orders for what was a different company or called a different company at the time. Um, but we did that for about a year and then eventually it just became busy and we're like, we can't continue doing this like this. Like, let's actually turn this into something. And so we made a business plan and, you know, we, we shopped it around and started looking for locations, but it was one of those situations where it was the chicken, you know, before the egg. So you couldn't get the space without having the money. You couldn't get the money without the space. And so we kind of went down this rabbit hole for a while, but Eventually, we got our first, you know, first taker, and we got a small investment um, from some friends and family, and then it became easier, and we found um, a location. And so, yeah, I would say about three years um, in the making. Nice, very nice. So, uh, Brittany, tell me about the early days of that first location. Like, what was it like the first day that you opened? Uh, we, yeah, we were we were terrified, <laughs> honestly. You know, I think that there. I, I tell people this a lot being where we were in life, there was a certain 
level of naivety that you just had to have to jump off and do something like this. Sure. And so we're really grateful that we had that. Um, we felt confident. We had worked in restaurants before. We could certainly figure out how to serve salads out of 300 square feet. Well, we had to be really innovative early on and, and get creative about how we were going to take this really big concept that we originally thought was going to be in 1800 square feet, squish it down to 300 square feet. And then we didn't even, you know, think about really volume at that time. How are we going to move people through this line quickly? So actually, the, some of our first team members that we brought on board, we really looked to them. and We were like, you've been in the fast casual space. You tell us what to do. And so it's it's really um, humbling looking back at those early days and just remembering how uneasy we felt about it all and how scared we were. Um, once the people started coming, I think that's something that we really have in common and something that we love about hospitality and restaurants and drew us in from the beginning. We love being around the people and being able to interact with them and in such a close and intimate way because of the size of the space was really energizing. And so I think that the initial fear slowly wore off as we saw those people coming in the door and we knew, you know, deep down that there were there were many people like us craving something new and refreshing and transparent and full of good ingredients that were going to make them feel good. So we were just really proud of the product we were offering. And I think quickly that that fear kind of mellowed as we welcomed people in the space. Was the uh, the first day was there a lot of people showing up like they were ready? They were ready to try it out or were you waiting around for people to come in? It was busy from from the back. We had a really great location. We were right on the corner of two really busy intersections in Chicago and we had, you know, windows on all sides and our food is really aesthetic. And so we display everything really beautifully. And so even if people had the intention to like check out what was this food market that we were in, you know, they ended up coming back to our space because the food was just so beautiful and, and you know, available for them to see. And we definitely believe that like you eat with your eyes first. And so we had a pretty long line. And I actually remember the first day that we were there, I think both of us were like, I don't, we're not going to be served. We don't know how to serve the customers. We'll just mm -hmm. like, we're, how are we going to talk to these people? We don't know how to do this. <laughs> but that quickly went away. And yeah, it was just so busy. And then it was a matter of optimizing, like efficiency, like really, how can we push these people through? Because they had a very short amount of time for lunch. And the efficiency from that, you know, front or that first location has really carried us through, through, because it's, it's a lot harder going from a big space to a small space, you know, than vice sure. versa. Is there one thing that stands out to you that you remember, like maybe once the people started flowing in, like, I didn't realize I didn't know this, you know, like, I, I didn't know that I didn't know this. Was there something that stood out to you um, at that time? Oh, man, so oh, many things. Yeah, there's so, <laughs> there's many, so things. many things. Um, hmm. Yeah. I mean, something like our bowl sizes, you know, we're like, well, we want people to be mixing around their salad in their bowl. So let's just buy a big bowl. Well, obviously you have a big bowl and then your team members are just like loading it up. So we would give people like three pounds of food, you know, and like people were taking it leftovers home for dinner. And we're like, well, this doesn't make sense. And so little things like that, that you just learn from experience that we wouldn't have, you know, figured out otherwise. Mm -hmm. So, um, Brittany, I mentioned you and Kaja uh, quickly bonded over your shared love for well-prepared but not over-involved food. What does that mean? Um, it means that food is most delicious in its simplest form if you're if you're using really good ingredients. And so I think that when people have a fear of cooking or preparing food or meal prep or whatever it is, if they have certain goals that they want to reach, it feels very intimidating. And it's because... I think we've let everything become so overcomplicated. But if you start with high quality ingredients that are seasonal and locally sourced, you're using the best quality you can find. And all you're really having to do at that point is enhance like their natural goodness and flavor. And so that comes with, you know, maybe it's a drizzle of like a local honey or really good salt or one or two er fresh herbs or dried you know, seeds or something that's going to just bring out either the sweetness or the smokiness in those um, ingredients that you're using. And so we like to say that, you know, simply good, that it's, it's, it's delicious, it's simple, you can look at the food and see what's in it, and really not have many questions past that. And then it is always a question of like, how did you make this so delicious? And people are often very surprised to learn that, it, you know, most of our dishes are less than five or six ingredients. And that they can be as good as they are. So it's just, yeah, about honoring, I think, the ingredients, the seasonality, and letting those things shine. 
Very nice. Hey, uh, Kaja, I saw on your LinkedIn page that uh, you said that fair is more than a restaurant. It's a movement towards healthier and more sustainable living. What does that kind of mean? Yeah. Yeah, we want to change the way that people think about healthy food. Healthy food doesn't have to be utilitarian. And flavor is one of our core values at FAIR. Like everything can really taste good and still be healthy at the same time. And we believe in, in balance. And we want food that's healthy to be approachable. And we want you to crave it. So, you know, nutrition is really important to us. But also the flavor has to be delicious. Like we're really big eaters. You know, we feel so passionately about the food that we eat. And those two can work hand in hand and we're just trying to change that and i think the other part of it is it's, it's not accessible you know like Brittany said i think sometimes it's intimidating to meal plan and to you know we live these busy lives to make these meals for yourself and we want it to be available to you you know nationally at every corner if possible who uh comes up with your ideas i know they're, they're simple flavorful and filling are you guys the the main kind of proprietor of each menu item we are. Um, that's something that we really come together on in the business, and it's really where it all started. And so we find that it's a great way for us to connect as partners and founders, stay close to what we're doing, and really get to interact with the customer in that way. I mean, in that first location on the corner of Wells and Wacker, we were there every single day, chopping the vegetables, roasting them, serving them, saucing them, all the things. And, um, you know, as we grow and have more locations, that's just not that's just not possible. And that's not what we're focused on so that we can grow in, in all the ways that we're dreaming of. And so when we come together to design each seasonal menu, that's really a time for us to reflect on what we're about, make sure that we're staying true to our values, and then also like just have some fun again and creativity in the kitchen. So um, we're really we're really proud of that. We're not culinary classically culinarily trained. Neither of us went to culinary school, but I really think that that's one of our greatest assets. We don't feel confined by rules or techniques. We really just go off of flavor, what tastes good, what feels good, and um, and are inspired by the seasons of it all. How many ideas make it compared to ones that never see the menu? It's <laughs> a good question. There's definitely some misses, and we're both pretty honest and transparent about that. We're always like, oh, this one didn't quite hit how we how we thought it was going to. Um, I would say every season we maybe make 15 new what we call toppers, which are like composed veggie uh, sides that go on top of the, the bowls and the plates. Um, about 15 and then we narrow it down to like seven core items that that stay on the menu and our team is involved also so they get to taste test some of these items and we get some feedback there and of course every season you know there's some favorites and we try to bring those back into the rotation in future seasons and yeah it's been really fun it's it's definitely our favorite part of of the business working together on the menu and then seeing just the joy that it brings to people's faces and everyone really loves the seasonal menu change and they get excited and hyped up about it you know both internally and the customers and yeah we love doing the menu how long had you been in that first location before you decided it was time to to grow um, we were there about a year and then we opened, um, we had the opportunity to open a second location at Timeout Market, which was another food hall in, in the Fulton Market neighborhood of Chicago. Um, so we opened there in November 2019 and then we all know what happened just a few months later and COVID struck. I mean, we we were in an interesting position because even with that other location open, um, we had already raised money to open a third, which would have been our first standalone storefront. So not in a call. It was going to be like our flagship, which is actually ironically just a couple doors down from where our flagship location is now, which we opened post COVID. So it was, yeah, it was an interesting time. Things felt like they were moving really quickly and we were so busy at Wall Street Market. We were excited to bring it to a new part of the city. Only had, you know, so many months to kind of test that out, which was a, a you know, a different neighborhood and a different experience um, before everything kind of shut down. What kind of new challenges did, you know, you'd already opened one, so you kind of knew what it was like to open one, but what kind of new challenges did expansion present to you? Obviously COVID was a whole new unexpected challenge, but, you know, just in terms of opening a new place, uh, what kind of new challenges did that present? Yeah, I think the neighborhood that we uh, went into was a little bit more residential, 
than where our first location was, which was in the central business district. And so the day parts shifted. And so instead of being extremely busy for this 1130 to 130 time period where we service, you know, three, 400 customers at Wall Street Market, we now had to figure out how to do breakfast on the weekends for brunch. And we were slinging egg sandwiches and and dinner. Um, and so I think what it really taught us is, is just being adaptable and really listening to the consumer and, you know, sticking to your core values, but also what does the consumer want? How are we going to please these people? How are we going to serve them what they're looking for? So I think that was a big challenge, but we were able to adapt and, you know, sold a lot of, a lot of egg sandwiches on Saturday. It was like a Sundays. diner. It, yeah. was, it was like a diner. It was pretty fun. <laughs> and then at that time, you know, two locations, we were able to split up still, um, you know, now we have more, so it's definitely a very different experience. And just really learning that your team is critical in, in growth. And so mm -hmm. if your team, you know, is not buying into it and if, if the culture isn't there, it's really hard to execute at the level that you want to. So I think that was, really instrumental time in learning that. How would you describe Bear's culture in terms of how the team would see it? Yeah, we um, we try to, again, involve them in every step of the process and really make the seasonality of the food and the excitement around these menu shifts um, a good time for everybody. So it's something that is unique to the fast casual space because it's already you know, such a quick paced environment. And so switching a menu every 12 weeks is a big undertaking. And we really need them to be on board with that. So we try to involve them in that. And then also just to teach them along the way about the ingredients and how important it is to, again, use quality things, to not use a lot of them, to minimize, to minimize process things and everything that we do and what and why we make that choice. And then they get to pass that on. And so I think that there's a lot of pride in what the product that they're putting out there. And so I'd say that keeping them close to the to the values of why we're doing what we're doing has been um, a big part of of keeping the culture uh, strong within our. Sure. Sure. Do you think the uh, the culture kind of translates to the customer like a customer can see what the culture is like in any For restaurant, sure. let alone fair? Yeah, we one of our team members last week just told us that they got matching tattoos um, at one of the locations. And, <laughs> you know, they, our customers are very repeats. So it's the same people come in over and over again mm -hmm. and they form relationships with them and they chit chat about their weekends and they talk about the new menu items. And you can feel the camaraderie and, you know, just the passion for what they're doing when they interact with the customers. I was looking at your website. It looks like you have one standalone restaurant, one that's in a food hall, and one that's in a hospital. Do you have to take um, – so those are all kind of different types of locations. Do you have to take different approaches at, at each place? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so we have two food, food hall locations um, in, in downtown, one standalone and one in the hospital. And, um, yes, definitely different approaches in terms of the menu. Um, we're not open for breakfast at all of the locations. And it, they're different customers, you know? You know, the hospital customer is a different customer than like the business district customer and, you know, different levels of speed. Sometimes you need more interaction. You need to, you know, spend more time with the guests um, versus like in our, you know, very busy locations where people just want to get in and out. So, yes, that that way there is a difference. But the food and, and the culture and the hospitality that we provide is consistent everywhere. How much of a challenge is it to from a logistics standpoint to kind of manage um all the seasonal ingredients from local farms. Yeah, we work with great um, partners. So our purveyors who who we order produce and our dry goods and things like that from, um, it's nice because it's something that people are asking for more. They want more transparency in their food and where it's coming from. And so we're able to get a lot of that from from these larger vendors. Um, you know, it, the farm piece of it is tricky. It We wish it was a lot easier to work directly, but a lot of times size is an issue. Can we get the right quantity that we need? Is the product going to be consistent? And so, yeah, working with some larger distributors who can kind of be that middleman between the two has been really key for us. And I think as we grow, those partnerships can blossom and grow. And we hope to be able to do some more things like contract and grow you know, certain ingredients that we use all the time to our spec that can be distributed all of, to all of our stores. Is it important to like stay informed or up to date on trends in healthy eating and sustainability? For sure. Yeah, I think that we're very much informed by what's happening around us. 
Um, we consider ourselves trendy, <laughs> trendy people. Um, and we're always learning about new ingredients and why something's good for you, or maybe it's not anymore. And, and that can be very confusing. And so it's always kind of a balance between, you know, us being able to translate that to our customer in a way that is feels really sturdy and solid. Like we've made a commitment to not use seed oils as an example ever in any of our restaurants. So we only use olive oil to roast with and in all our sauces and dressings, sometimes coconut oil or avocado oil, but never would you find like a canola oil or sunflower oil or something like this that we just have enough research on to make the commitment to not do that. So um, I think it's just choosing some of these things and looking at our menu as a whole and kind of our path for growth. What are some upgrades that we'd like to make along the way that are going to make a really significant difference and matter to people? So it is a balance between, you know, what we find really trendy and we can geek out on health stuff and what kind of the masses are looking for and wanting to be on the forefront of those things, but also not like going too, too deep, too fast. And the menu is yeah. very Versatile. So we try to stay away from, you know, fads, but really because the menu is so versatile, there's so much like you can customize where we're able to accommodate a lot of these, you know, diets that people may be experiencing at that time or what they feel is good for them. So, you know, as much as like we're not necessarily promoting that we're a keto or paleo or whatever it may be, I mean, the menu does accommodate a lot of these dietary restrictions, which really helps us. Yeah, you guys are, you're, you, uh, you know, you, it, any type of dieter can really go there and eat there. How do you kind of make sure that the food is still delicious, even though uh, maybe it doesn't contain, you know, certain items that certain people won't eat? How do we make it delicious? Yeah. Without those things? The good ingredients. Yes, yes. It all comes back to really the quality of the ingredients and using things that are in season. I mean, we do that for more than one reason. They taste better when you're eating things that are growing during that time when they're not coming from overseas. And also the nutrient density of those foods is greater when you're eating them in the season that they're growing in. So it's gonna make you feel better and it's gonna taste better. It's definitely, you know, a win-win. Why is it important to be transparent um, to your customers? That's always been really important to us. And that's really why we started FAIR. You know, there were healthy places to eat, but we really didn't trust what was in the food. And, you know, maybe you were having a salad, but who knows what was in that salad dressing. And so we just want to, to be a place where no matter what, you can go there at anything that you order, you know what's in it and you trust that whatever we selected is good for you. It's nourishing. It's good for your body. And it's actually what we say that it is. I mean, we eat there very often. Our families eat there and this is how we want to feed our people and this is how we want to feed the community and and trust and transparency is important to us and we want to give that to the community um i think i saw that you, you've been featured in various chicago media outlets and you've been called a chicago media darling how uh, how important has that been in your your growth and your success Brittany? um we've really been held by the community that we were in i think that from day one people were excited to see two women back there serving the food. And again, because we love that hospitality piece of it, we got to know, just like our team does now, we got to know a lot of those people who were coming in every every day and every week. And so we, we kind of had that connection off the bat and we really leaned on that to get us through some tough times like COVID and reemerge with still a lot of brand loyalty, which was important to us. And that was, you know, it's been it's been authentic and also strategic. We've taken them along for the ride on social media and kept in touch um, other ways with email marketing and in-store communications and things like that. So it's any community that we're in. And right now it's mostly been the loop. And, and as we get ready for expansion, we will now be out in other neighborhoods and communities like that's going to be wildly important for us to be embraced, lean on them, gain their trust. And then and then those people become ambassadors for your brand. And so just staying, cl staying close to the brand is, is how we've been able to do that. What, uh, do you have anything coming up for the future? What's some of your, um, what's your vision maybe for the future? We have lots coming lots, up for the future. Lots of things. <laughs> we have the immediate future, which is opening a lot of locations in Chicago. So we have Nothing is quite signed, but we're almost there. We have a location coming to Logan Square. Um, we have another location coming to The Loop, um, which is exciting. Um, we're also looking at a few other neighborhoods. 
And we also have some national expansion happening um, in early 2026, going to Charlotte, North Carolina. So we're really excited about that nice. being our second market out of Chicago. So yeah, lot, lots of things in the works. What's going to go into, you know, kind of going into a different state? Again, that's going to split us. So we're lucky that there's two of us, um, you know, but one of us will be able to travel. And and like we said before, just really having the team buy into what we're doing. And we have allow the team to participate in what we call a profit share. So we really also incentivize them and we have operating partners. And so our goal is to find an operating partner there that really takes on that market and, and helps it grow and is really like a true partner to us, not just, you know, an employee. Um, so finding that person is going to be really, really, really critical to, you know, find someone that's authentic to what we're doing and, and someone that can help us, you know, really go to that next level there and someone that we trust. Um, but it'll be exciting exploring, you know, a, a totally different market. And yeah, in Charlotte, there's a lot of sunshine and a lot of need for healthy food. I have one more question for you guys, but uh, first, how can people find out more about FAIR? Yeah, you can visit us at foodbyfair.com. And there you'll find a list of all our locations, our philosophies and values on our food, a link to follow us on social media, catering, anything, you, anything you'd want to know you can find there. Um, and then, of course, you can visit us in-store in Chicago at any of our four locations. So uh, if you were to go to FAIR as a customer, this may be challenging because you guys change your menu frequently, but what would you say is maybe like a go-to item? Like this is, this is my thing when I go to FAIR as a customer for each of you. Well, right now, what I would pick um, for, for fall vibes, we just launched a turkey sweet potato chili that's served with a mini cornbread muffin that's vegan and gluten-free. Unintentionally, you would never even know, and it's so delicious. Um, I think that's what I would pick right now. Yeah, and I love to make a bowl. Um, and because, again, the season, it's like all about hearty stuff. We've got some hearty things on the menu. I'd start with a base of kale, our lemony kale. I'd do our antipasto salad with some like chickpeas and um, cucumbers, sun-dried tomatoes, and some really good bold flavors in there. I do the squash, which is some roasted butternut squash with agri-dolce. It's like a, a sweet and savory sauce and it has toasted walnuts in it. Um, and then I put a piece of salmon on top and we just, with this season, launched a new dressing. Our dressings are huge. Like we're always, sauces can be can be a mystery sometimes. Like what's in there? Are there sugars? Are there weird oils? And ours don't have any of those things. And we have a Greek yogurt ranch, which is just, I, I mean, I could drink it. So, so that, that's what I can go for. <laughs> nice, very nice. Oh, and uh, brownie. We oh, make yes. some really great pastries. We we like something sweet at the end of our meal, so we would have one of those. Yeah, perfect. I'm starving now. Hey, uh, <laughs> thanks so much, guys. Brittany and Kaja, it's been great to talk to you. Thanks for sharing your uh, insights and your stories. Really appreciate it. All right, thank you. We'll so long, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Top Business Leaders Show, powered by Rise Twenty Five. Visit rise25.com to check out more episodes of the show and to learn more about how you can start your own podcast.